Sí. Do you know what pretty much accurately sums up my feelings towards season eight? And nothing towards the actors, the cinematographers, anything like that. More specifically, towards D&D. David Benioff and Dan Weiss. This pretty much describes how I feel towards them right now upon finishing season eight of Game of Thrones. Investing eight years, not even eight, 10 years technically when you think about it because there are time in between seasons. Investing 10 years of my life into this show, which arguably, especially more arguably now, was for a long time something I consider to be the greatest show on television. This clip right here pretty much sums up how I feel towards Dave and Dan. So Dave and Dan, this one's for you. This one is directly at you. This is how I feel. Roll the clip. You were the chosen one! It was said that you would destroy this and not join them! Bring balance to the force! Not leave it in darkness! What's up, guys, and welcome to the Web Source Must See Comic and Nerd Culture Show, and welcome to the Comic Universe. I'm Dr. J. As you can see here, I'm rolling solo here on this video. And all jokes aside, I am here to talk about, honestly, what is still one of the best shows on television at the end of an era, even if that end was on a lackluster note. I still have to, you know, give it my respects. And of course, we are talking about. Game of Thrones Season 8, basically my overall review of the season. So I'm going to be honest with you guys, the quickest, easiest way I can sum Season 8 up is style over substance. And I will be going into full spoilers with this review, so if you have not been watching Game of Thrones Season 8 or you haven't caught up, didn't see all the way to the finale. What are you doing? Don't watch this video because I'm going into full spoilers. So, like I said, the best way to sum up Game of Thrones Season 8 in one sentence is style over substance. Everything in this season looked absolutely amazing. The acting, top-notch, supreme, superb, all the adjectives that you normally use to describe Game of Thrones. You know, in terms of production, it is definitely on a whole nother level and it's just a marvel to watch and to look at. The cinematography, the different shots, the costume designs, the sets, the choreography for the battles. You know, the ones you can actually see though, but you know, the choreography of the battles nonetheless. But still, a lot of style and a lot of visually pleasing stuff and definitely a lot of great fan service and service to nostalgia really kind of playing up all the different things that you know we've loved all throughout the seven previous seasons but at the same time it kind of lacks what made game of thrones so amazing right so game of thrones as a show was always that show that it wasn't just a you know kill people off for shock value and you know no one's safe the main characters can even die too like I'll admit that's an element of it sure but I mean that's kind of the same situation with Walking Dead right and what separated Game of Thrones and Walking Dead was the interesting political maneuvering these character dynamics and all the different plans and machinations and the build up and payoff build up and payoff were always two key components of game of thrones george r r martin always talks about how his writing style he refers to it as gardening he'll plant seeds and he'll water something you know little bits over time and eventually it'll bloom into something 
big and beautiful. But, like, with this season, it gives you the payoff, but it really doesn't deliver on the build-up. And, like, if you go in with expectations of, like, just looking for certain things and certain, like, fan service stuff, yeah, you can definitely have a good time with this season because it's super well-made. But, like, if you're one of those people, like myself, who was really invested in the story, the machinations, the character development, the different arcs, where they were set to go, this is definitely going to be a letdown for you. I know it was for me. Um, a lot of the things that they set up in the previous seasons, it just felt as if they didn't amount to anything. And some of the things that were set up were, you know, made sense overall, but also felt extremely rushed and sudden. And that's the big problem. It's not that they weren't foreshadowed or probably built out or anything like that. It was just that the things that happened kind of just happened. Like, you know, I'm sure plenty of other Game of Thrones YouTubers have mentioned this, you know, in their videos, but like, you can tell after season five, when they ran out of book material, that's when they really started to struggle because they were just going off of George's cliff notes. And for this season in particular, I feel as though they were going off a bunch of boxes on a checklist. And they were checking those off, but they were missing the middle pieces, the stuff that helped build to it. So while some of the stuff that happened is definitely cool visually and still does make sense in a big picture sense, I guess. It doesn't make sense in terms of like going cohesively from point to point. Like you in season four set up Jamie Lannister on this like redemptive arc when he tells Brienne about why he killed the Mad King to save all those innocent people. And he's on this arc, and he's shown that he wants to be a better man. And I get the idea of Jamie backsliding to Cersei because he just feels like he couldn't do it, and he wants to go back to what's comfortable. But here's my thing, right? So you build Jamie's redemption arc, and what you do instead of having him die tragically with, you know, his arms around Cersei, but at the same time, like, he kills her with the last bit of his strength, but yet they still die intertwined in the arms of the person that they love. That's the tragedy I was expecting, not just Jamie going back to Cersei and embracing her as they die. Don't get me wrong, Lena Headey's performance, her whole I don't want to die speech was beautiful, but at the same time, how do you expect me to feel bad for Cersei? And I don't think that's the point, right? You're not supposed to feel bad for her, but like at the same time, like the way they shot that, that's just how it gave me the vibe of that's how they wanted us to feel. But that's just not it. That ain't it, chief. And seriously, with Jamie alone, right? Even if you had just did the Cersei and Jamie ending the way you did it, I might have been okay with it if you hadn't have done the scene right before that when Tyrion is talking to Jamie and he's saying, you know, you need to do this, ring the bells to stop Daenerys' attack. And Jamie says, I don't really care for the people that much. When Tyrion says, think of all the innocent people, the women and children that could be burned alive. Jamie says, I don't really care for them much. I never really cared for them much. That is a direct contradiction of Jamie Lannister at his most honest, right? Which is complete and utter crap. That is full of crap. I don't buy that whatsoever. And I really did not like just 
how some of the stuff that we've been building up ended up meaning nothing. Like, John's true parentage be- being revealed to be Aegon the Sixth, right? The son of Rhaegar and Lyanna. It was used as a means to set up an obstacle for Daenerys and a wedge between Jon and Danny. But no one else besides, like, Sansa and Tyrion really used that information at all. I mean, Varys tried to, and that got him killed. But, like, that didn't come into play anywhere else, and that just feels kind of hollow. Arya and her face-stealing training, right? She spent all that time in Braavos learning how to steal faces and how to kill. Now, granted, her, like, battle skills obviously came into handy, but, like... Why has she never used her face-stealing skills ever again? It feels like we went to the faceless assassins just for nothing. I mean, I feel like you could have gotten the same training from, like, a company of cell sorts, right? Or you could be a good warrior, but what was the point of going to that specific place with the people with that specific skill set and power set if you're never going to use that besides the Walter Frey assassination? That seems completely pointless. What the heck? And freaking Bran, okay? Bran. Look, I am very, I'm confused on the Bran thing. Not just because it kinda came out of nowhere, but like, it's like one of the safest choices ever because I feel as though No one really likes or hates Bran. Everybody's just kind of meh on Bran. He's just kind of there. And he's been just kind of there ever since he became the Three-Eyed Raven. Like, he helped out with the Battle of Winterfell, sure. But then after that, he kind of dips and then just randomly shows up again to be crowned. Like, I understand how, like, the flashbacks and being able to see the past and look into individual people's lives and their past could be useful. He would be an amazing master of whispers, but how does that make him an effective king, right? He's so detached from humanity. How can he actually make humane decisions? It seems as though he's just a servant of fate and he's going to let history play out as history is intended to play. So it's not going to matter what people die, what kind of strife the realm goes through, because Bran's gonna know, oh, it was meant to happen, so it shall happen. So how does that make him an effective ruler? That doesn't make any sense. Now I did like the abolishment of the Iron Throne system, and I think, you know, this whole High Council thing was definitely a step in the right direction, I will give you that. But None of that makes any sense to me with Bran being chosen. I'm not saying I wanted Jon, honestly. Having Jon go north and kind of basically become king beyond the wall, perfect. Honestly, that makes sense. I'm cool with that. I'm not saying I wanted Jon on the throne. I'm just saying I wanted somebody, you know, who is more capable. Even if they had like a constitutional monarchy type of situation where they have somebody who is a nice figurehead, but the real decisions for the realm would be made by the lords and ladies of Westeros, that would have been fine. But I don't get why Bran was elected at all. Makes no sense. He makes a good master of whispers, sure, and he does a lot of other jobs effectively. He's a good advisor, but how can he rule effectively? Doesn't make any sense. And even if, you know, the decisions are made by the council, and he's just a figurehead, who would sympathize with this kid as a figurehead? No one knows him. He's basically a robot. Like, it's not as if he has a charisma that can draw the people to him. Like... Even Gendry would have been a better candidate because he has, you know, Robert's blood in him. And honestly, if you really think about it in hindsight, like prior to all this chaos, everybody was relatively happy under Robert's rule. And so people probably have much fonder memories now that like all this War of the Five Kings stuff is behind them. They probably have a lot fonder memories of Robert and would have accepted Gendry Baratheon as a figurehead king while the lords and ladies of Westeros 
made the real decisions, right? That would have been fine. And, you know, still having a king also opens the Game of Thrones still being there, like the, the scheming, the politicking, which I actually liked because, you know, that's kind of how Martin has set this up. The cycle will never really end. But still, that's still kind of like just weird to me. Also, it's also very weird to me in a show that has never been about giving the characters happy endings. Suddenly gives pretty much everybody except for Daenerys a happy ending. So let's go through it real quick, right? Jon basically gets to become king beyond the wall. Arya gets to go west of Westeros, go find the One Piece, become Pirate King. Cool. Sansa gets crowned Queen of the North, which I was totally happy for. Sansa was right. All hail Queen Sansa. So, good for Sansa. And then we got Brienne as Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. Well deserved, Sir Brienne. Great job. Pod, he gets knighted and promoted to Kingsguard. Good for Pod, but uh, okay, that's a little weird. This is where I get to issue, and this comes to like bad fan fiction territory. Samuel Tarly becomes Grand Maester of the Six Kingdoms. We see not a single chain on this man. This man has not completed his maester training. He doesn't have his degree, and yet he is qualified to be the maester of not just a house, right? Not just a house, but an entire realm. Also, how can he be a maester if he and Gilly are a thing and he has like a child and all that stuff? So, like, is Gilly like Lady Tarly now and little Sam and like the baby that she's pregnant with? Are they like the heirs to Horn Hill and stuff? These are all questions that I have that will never be answered until I read, like, A Dream of Spring. But still, like, those are very happy endings. And not to quote a sociopath here, but if you thought this was going to have a happy ending, you clearly weren't paying attention. The fact that I have to quote Ramsey Snow is just so sad. Like... Were D and D not paying attention? Because everybody pretty much got a happy ending except for Danny, and even with Danny, right? Let's talk about that also, okay? So we all pretty much figured that Danny was gonna eventually go crazy and have to be killed by John, but like there was no significant build up to the moment, right? And I hated the fact that in season eight, like in the finale, John and Tyrion basically have the argument that the fans have, but that argument makes no sense. All the people that Danny killed, the slavers, you know, the um, Zerozo and Daxis, the Dothraki, all those people, they were evil people, yes. And those were justified, yes. But also, the slaughter of innocents was never on the table. She was always completely against murdering innocent people. But yet, when she reaches her goal, the people fully surrender and accept her and are letting her in. She decides to suddenly just snap and murder innocent people. Like, yes, a lot of messed up things has happened to her in a short amount of time. The death of Masande, the death of two of her dragons. But need I remind you that all the Starks, all the remaining Starks, have seen or at least know of the brutal murder of their entire house. And yet none of them have resorted to killing innocent people. Everyone on this show that is still alive has had something messed up happen to them, but none of them have killed innocent people. And Daenerys, the person who never, in her entire journey in the previous seven seasons, had even considered for a split second to harm an innocent person, basically massacred an entire city of innocent people. It doesn't make any sense. 
And Danny's ideology has always been about leaving the world better than we found it. And yet, now, and now she talks about ruling the world. Yet, when she first came on the scene, her goal was to get to Westeros and make Westeros a better place. But now she wants to suddenly become a world dictator and take over the entire world. How does that line up with her character? That is such a huge jump. Doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Like, I get that she had to die, but man. And also, her death was super quick. She literally just kind of walks to the throne. She gives the speech to the Dothraki and the Unsullied about, you know, her world domination. She walks to the throne and muses about, like, her dreams of being here. And then she dies. She gets stabbed by Jon Snow. <sighs> just it felt rushed and anticlimactic. That's basically how the entire season felt, honestly. And that's my biggest issue. Like, hopefully when the books are over, um, you know, in a decade or so, maybe we can try this again and give Game of Thrones the Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood treatment. But until then, this is what we have. But, you know, let's not just acknowledge the, the horribleness, you know, that is the previous season or, you know, season eight. There are still good things that came out of it. A lot of great visuals, great acting. Everything on a technical level was just top notch. But, like, just this writing. At least we have the book to look forward to, guys. Please, you know, I know some of you may think that it's such a daunting task, especially with the amount of pages that are, that are in these books. But if you want to see the proper buildup, even if it does lead to these events, like with Bran being king and all that stuff, at least Martin has a completely different medium where he can spend as much time as he needs to to explain and build up to these moments where they won't feel as rushed and as out of left field. And I doubt that these are going to be exactly the same. Even if Martin has said that the show and the books end the same way, in recent interviews he's even said like, yes, no, and yes, and no. Like, it's not going to be exactly the same. It's going to be different, and at least it's going to feel a lot more earned because this season did not feel earned at all. But anyway, you guys, uh, Excuse the extremely long video. I just have a lot of feelings about this particular season. But let me know what you guys thought about it in the comments down below. As always, don't forget to leave this video a like to let me know you enjoyed it. And if you like what we do here and you want to see more from myself, DPZ, and C-Dubs, be sure to hit that subscribe button and notification bell so you get notified every time we upload new videos. We've got a lot of great content coming up for you guys. So, until next time, this is Dr. J from Mr. Stage Reviews for the comic universe. Hopefully, I'll see you guys next time in the universe. Valar Magulis.